I'd like to um, give you a kind of a contrast view uh, as a way of introduction. Um, a contrast view of uh, Germany and Europe um, at a time when I decided to work more in Europe and today. Now it so happened that 30 years ago uh, in the mid 80s, um, I decided to move away from academia into the think tank world. And I, the transition was somewhat smooth because I first started uh, to do policy work at a university and then kind of build a public policy think tank at a university. But I thought that would be more interesting than, than uh, 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 the academic uh, debates which were rather specialist and rather peculiarist and rather about pushing people into niches than letting them to see the bigger picture. And I was always interested in the bigger picture. And it so happened that at the time of the mid-80s, uh, Europe uh, was getting back on the move again. Now, it's not that it has been on the move all the time. Actually, in 85, it had, was just ending about a decade, or if not more, of a relative stagnation. It was the community of 12 member states. Germany was the strongest economy in this. Uh, Germany was a junior partner to the politically strongest member state at the time, France. Um, there were interesting dynamics between uh, Germany and France. Think of the 1984 um, visit of both uh, François Mitterrand and, um, and Helmut Kohl to Verdun. It was the first time that a French president visited um, a uh, mass graveyard where also German soldiers were buried. And there was this handshake, uh, or this taken, it wasn't a handshake, they took each other's hand uh, in the commemoration ceremony, which also shows that at that time, the past, Germany's past in particular, was very much present. And there was still a need to uh, go back to some of the uh, places and situations um, which were connected with Germany's past, both its World War II and its World War I past, in order to demonstrate that this was a different country. It was a different Germany, and there was a different type of relationship between Germany uh, and its neighbors. Ten years later, ten years after this 1984 handshake, there was another one of those gestures. Uh, the Euro Corps, the German participants of the Euro Corps being invited to parade on 14th of July, down the Champs-Élysées. And one of the most vocal statements on uh, French television and in French media was Giscard d'Estaing complaining about the situation, saying that as a young boy, uh, his, uh, his, uh, uh, the, the apartment of his uh, parents was on Champs-Élysées, and he could see daily parading German troops down Champs-Élysées, and he was disturbed by the fact that they were parading down Champs-Élysées again. But you know, Mitterrand's idea was to demonstrate to the French with this invitation that he believed that this was a different country. So on this, on this uh, non-economic, non-institutional level, on the level of uh, uh, social psychology, of political emotions, uh, this you know, kind of the software of European integration, there was still a lot of work to be done in that situation of 30 years back. But there also was, 30 years back, there was an architect, architect's coalition of the founding members who very much saw themselves as the principal stakeholders uh, of this integration process and the principal advocates of carrying forward uh, integration. And this six plus six, you know, six founders and six newer members was, gave them adequate room uh, to actually um, not dominate, but shape uh, the policy debate inside the European Union. There was, from a German perspective, a like-minded accession uh, to the North, uh, with Denmark, the United Kingdom, and Ireland having joined, countries where there was a number of shared preferences, particularly with the Danes uh, and the Brits. The Irish people didn't know really uh, what they were about. Uh, they kind of, in the German view, came on the back of uh, uh, UK membership. 
There was a manageable transformation challenge to the South, with Greece joining in 81, uh, and on January 86, uh, Spain and Portugal joining. So that all looked uh, as if it was designed uh, for a country like Germany being divided uh, and being still a front state in a otherwise moderated east-west conflict um, to, uh, to unfold and to act and to shape its environment. The political agenda of German European policy at the time was integration must succeed. It should not be allowed over the longer term to stagnate or to regress. Because it was the anchor, not just an anchor, it was the anchor of Germany's role in Europe, of Germany's international role in a wider sense. Political integration should uh, advance. And also economic integration in the German thinking of the time was basically about political integration. Economics was an instrument to drive the building of uh, a political union uh, rather than being pursued on its more narrow merits uh, alone. The EU's competitiveness at the time was an issue of concern of German policymaking uh, because Germany saw that there was a trend that it would kind of separate itself too much in terms of competitiveness uh, from a number of its uh, other partners. Uh, so there was reason to help shape up the EU union at large in order to, to keep um, a certain level of, of complementarity uh, inside the EU. And Germany was prepared uh, to do what it takes, to quote from Mario Draghi, uh, to make that possible. And one of the means German EU policy at the time employed was actually to be ready uh, to fund change in the European Union and that was when this was necessary. Think of the uh, famous, I think to Europeanists, maybe to the outside world, it is, it is just a footnote in the history books, but to the Europeanists it was, um, was a rather significant date in February 1988 there was big controversy among member states about the single market. A number of countries, Germany included, very much wanted it. UK very much wanted it. Uh, but other member states thought that this would be too harsh. And actually, uh, they needed compensation if they were supposed to open their markets in the way that uh, Delors' uh, white paper had proposed. So the doubling of structural funds was their principal issue. There was no agreement. Britain was drawing red lines, which is a particularity of, of British politics. So it was then up to the Germans to say, OK, if at the end of the day it's three billion Deutschmark that's missing in the budget in order to have a deal, we will pay in that three billion. Four years earlier, uh, Margaret Thatcher had, had negotiated her rebate. And she was not prepared to say, OK, I give up 30% of the rebate in order to get it done. But you know, at the time, that was the German position. Everybody was expecting the Germans to chip in the extra contribution when that was needed in order to get something done. And Germany did, even though there was a kind of paymaster debate at times at home, because the political reasoning of the German political class was this was too important to fail over disagreement over three billion Deutschmarks. So Germany's position, to sum it up, was a driver of integration uh, embedded in a triple support structure that I've laid out, this Franco-German relationship, the founders group, uh, and this kind of Protestant enlargement, not in the religious sense, but in the kind of the, the business ethic uh, sense of that. Um, an enlargement to the north that sort of enlarged the group sharing a number of the preferences on economics but also on social policy on how to run a modern state uh, uh, as Germany did. Germany was perceived as a lead 
country in this European community because it was more integrationist than France. It was the most preferred partner of the smaller member states in this uh, community because it was very understanding. On a bilateral perspective, Germany was able to compensate part of its junior status in relations to France because it had that relationship with the smaller states. And German governments paid great attention to talking to smaller member states a lot in order to be seen as uh, the country that would then bring in their views uh, and interests into this principal bargaining that was going on uh, all the time with, um, uh, with France. Fast forward 30 years. Where are we today? And I say that now, uh, as Catherine mentioned, uh, in the luxury of an observer position, after having engaged uh, a lot also in, in consulting governments, the German government mostly, but also other governments, on this rather fascinating period over since 89, with the many changes that we have seen, um, now we're in the EU 28. Now we're in a much more fragmented environment, much less structured than even the EU 12 uh, was at the time. We have Germany united under the coal paradigm, which was at the time, you know, before 1989, coal's innovation to this traditional conservative position on, German, on the German question was that the German question was not a question of unity but it was a question of freedom. You know? And when unification came about, it precisely came about as a consequence of understanding it as a question of freedom and not in principal terms as a question of unity. Germany, again, is the strongest economy, even though it uh, elevated into that position uh, in a different way than many people in, in uh, Germany thought in the early 90s when they still thought that the biggest economy of the West and the biggest economy of the East uh, would necessarily be um, a super economy. But then the Soviet Union collapsed and the biggest economy of the East uh, all of a sudden um, with losing its markets and losing its, uh, its monetary advantage uh, collapsed rather uh, thoroughly. It now is a senior partner to France at least when it comes to EU matters. The past is still present, but in a very different way. Not in the way of this immediate connex to Germany's past, not in the way that it guides government policy on an almost monthly basis as it used to 30 years back, but rather in the way of political caricatures of uh, uh, Merkel or Schäuble being uh, portrayed in Nazi uniform or with, or with a Hitler mustache, uh, or this, this debate about uh, the repayment uh, from, from wartime occupation, um, uh, or the Piketty argument that Germany is the one country in the world that never repaid its debt, oh, which, is, which is not true. Um, um, but it's interesting that, that you know, it comes up in, in, in these contexts. Now, this EU28 exists on a much higher level of integration, but on a much lower level of diffuse support for integration. And that largely affects also policymaking uh, in Germany today. The German public used to be pro-European, very pro-European in a diffuse way. People may have had second thoughts about the merits of certain steps in the integration process, but they thought, that the principal idea that integration must not fail because it is the framework for Germany to, to live and prosper and share with its neighbors, um, that isn't valid anymore. It's not that the Germans have turned away from Europe. They are still, you know, if you look at Eurobarometer findings, where they are still pretty much uh, up there uh, not in that high uh, uh, range of numbers, but in a good middle uh, position. But they are much less willing to give Europe the benefit of the doubt. 
See, when we're not convinced, but when, when our leaders tell us we have to do it, we'll do it. Now leaders, such as Angela Merkel, are very cautious not to do anything that could irritate her public, that could raise uh, the, the more distant or more self-centered feelings of the Germans to focus on Europe. She doesn't want a big European debate at home because she senses that this debate would not necessarily um, expand her policy options, but rather limit them further. But also the EU has changed. It's not just that Germany is in a much different position, but the EU environment is much different compared to 30 years ago. The architect coalition of the founders is gone and is not going to come back. There is no consensus group of these six countries today anymore. The like-minded accession idea um, also has sort of withered away because the Eurozone has two of the like-minded countries out, Denmark uh, and the UK. It has brought about other countries uh, in the inner ring of integration, but not necessarily on, on that level of consensus that has been characteristic for the Founders uh, Coalition. Many member states take a more instrumental cost-benefit approach to integration, and so does Germany. Many in Germany are aware of the fact that EU enlargement has meant that we're now surrounded by friends, that in all directions, and no other EU country has more direct neighbors than, than Germany has, we have neighbor, uh, members of the EU, except for Switzerland, but that's kind of half, half connected uh, to it anyway, so it doesn't really feel like non-EU uh, in this sense. We have a big transformation challenge in the East from a Berlin view, mostly done. It's not done really, but it has been rather successful. It has brought about a number of not fully consolidated, but fairly stable and rising uh, new member states, mostly somehow friendly to Germany, sometimes more, sometimes less. That's, for example, the Czech Republic at times, or Hungary at times, uh, or Poland at times, but mostly pretty close to Germany. With Germany being the biggest economic partner of most of these new members, uh, and it's an economic partnership under the roof of the European Union, which I think is a very effective means, and it's perceived as that, to control possible anti-German uh, tendencies there. The transformation model south over the past 30 years has not thoroughly succeeded. Uh, and one of the pet childs of uh, Germany's political integration um, plan, a politically motivated economic and monetary union, um, has not brought that about but rather exposed the fact that it has not worked uh, much uh, uh, more intensely than, than German policymakers have ever planned. In this, Europe, Germany is clearly in a lead uh, position, partly by default, because other traditional leaders uh, are much weaker on a number of key policy issues. I've already alluded to the Franco-German relationship, France now is much less of a shaping actor uh, in European affairs than it used to be. Uh, Britain is mostly absent uh, from the EU. Italy is largely absent uh, from seeking to shape uh, the European Union. And also, uh, it is in a lead position because the most pressing policy issues on the EU external and internal agenda all favor Germany's central position, whether it is crisis management inside the Eurozone or it is the foreign policy challenge of a um, uh, changing, resurgent Russia, uh, both 
put Berlin uh, on a spot in the way that, that it, it does not with any other country. So what's Berlin's political agenda in this kind of environment? It is sort of a visionless uh, policy, very pragmatic. The Merkel approach is, is not to move Europe ahead uh, towards deeper integration, but rather to prevent it from eroding, from disintegrating, to keep the current level of integration. Europe still is in the reading of the German political class, an important anchor of Germany's <coughs> role, but not the only anchor of Germany's role. The agenda uh, also has to maintain public support through intergovernmental cooperation, particularly the Merkel, but also in a certain way the Schroeder government. Uh, you know, the Schroeder, Schroeder was a little bit moderated by the fact that, that there was Joschka Fischer, who was, uh, who was a coal man, in a way, even though he was a green. But he shared with Helmut Kohl the idea that Germany always needs to have a bigger idea about Europe in order uh, to uh, keep on track, to keep on its post-war track, and in order to move uh, Europe uh, and make it more capable of acting. But, um, Presently, the, the Chancellor believes, and Schroeder uh, also believed in it, that intergovernmental cooperation and the visibility of that cooperation um, is a good way to, um, to keep the German public attached uh, to it. Because it would show leaders at the helm. And the European Council, uh, with this sort of approach, has become the principal decision-making body uh, of the European Union um, is trending to use the European Commission as kind of an extended workbench. There has been no time in the history of the of the uh, of European integration um, that that European councils have given so detailed uh, assignments to the Commission with timelines, with benchmarks, with ideas on what it should do. Uh, than we have seen over the past uh, few years. German, uh, the German strategy or agenda or approach to Europe also has it to counter the obvious centrifugal trends uh, and political cleavages inside this EU 28 uh, through a strong focus on rules uh, and due process, which is a traditional German bias. Um, I think in terms of political culture, uh, we have a trend to uh, focus much more on rules than on political bargaining uh, compared to other countries because we've, I think many Germans have a mistrust in politics. We think that, that compromise is a dirty thing, you know, it's, it's, it's dubious you know, because it is like horse trading. Are you, uh, you, you have to give something and you get something, but it, it, it doesn't have to do with the good thing, with how things ought to be. So this kind of normative thinking that is very strong in Germany kind of supports a focus to seek to steer the European Union uh, through a focus on rules, to kind of depoliticize um, uh, uh, policy making in the Union, which of course is a difficult proposition at a time when so much uh, in its current dealings is all about politics. You know? And then the rules uh, appear to be ideology uh, rather than kind of a concept of order, which in the thinking of many in the German political class, it still is. It's, a, it's, an, it's about the good order of things. Now, um, this, is, this, is, uh, this is the situation. In this I believe um, Germany has lost, uh, to a good degree, kind of its strategic sense, uh, or the wisdom or wisdoms of earlier uh, periods, in the sense that indeed uh, uh, Europe does need an ambition of what it wants to be, 
in order to help to bring together uh, the divergencies and the heterogeneity uh, of this European Union. That has worked very well in the past, but somehow political leaders, including German political leaders, think that with a, such a heterogeneous union as we have now, it cannot work. I would submit it still can work, but you have to have those ideas, and you have to be credible with them. They can't just be bubbles uh, of uh, political uh, spin doctors. You have to have a credible actors uh, who believe in what they say. And the current chancellor doesn't have such a vision. And if she would you know, kind of borrow from cold speeches or Adenauer speeches or Brunt speeches, people wouldn't believe her because it's not her. Secondly, there's much less emphasis on uh, talking uh, with the smaller countries. For some reason, German political class seems to have concluded that this traditional mechanism, bring on board the smaller ones, use this as a platform to get things done, is not in high respect. Catherine and I, uh, we were at a conference last year when we tried to, to, to discuss with people from member state governments and member state think tanks just this. Just this, this the, the, you know, the, the interactions between member states and what, you, what we could hear then and what I hear a lot when I talk to, to key diplomats from other member states is the Germans don't talk. They don't come to us anymore. They expect us to come to Berlin and then it's difficult for us to get some, some face time because everybody's coming to Berlin nowadays but they don't reach out enough. I think that's the second gap in the, in, the, in the strategy. And the third one is um, that with all you know, the good reasoning about rule-based uh, policy approaches, I think they only work if you try to cover all of your bases. If you just don't rely uh, on rules alone, but you uh, try to build consensus around them. You try to, to uh, caution the effect that r strict rules application has on other member states. You try to understand the difficulties that there are, and you try to put yourself in the shoes of others. It has been uh, uh, said that, that one of the, the, the hubris of, uh, of powerful actors is that they don't need to learn. And a, and a bit of that you can see uh, in the German case, that they think, that many in the political class think it doesn't really matter that much whether you bring uh, people in. You seek to modify the expectations and preferences other partners have, but you rely on the fact that they have no choice but to go along anyway. I think that that's kind of a backgrounder to some of the, uh, the divisions of the cleavages but also of the, of the rather sharp uh, perceptions uh, that, that shape, the, uh, um, that shape the, the attitudes towards Germany these days. Um, and maybe it can serve as, a, as an opening to uh, a discussion. As you see, I've left out um, any deeper arguments about uh, Germany and Greece uh, and the Eurozone. But um, feel free to raise all of these issues because I'd be eager to respond to them. Thank you very much.